Hi, everybody. Welcome to our MD Stewardship Competency-Based Education webinar series. Uh, I'm Dr. Horn. I'm Dr. Vivekanandan. And we're infectious disease physicians, uh, and we're happy to bring you this topic today. It's diagnosis and treatment of cellulitis. So we're going to be discussing uh, cellulitis, and we thought we would start with assessment and diagnosis. So the mo most important thing here is going to be history and physical. So when a patient comes in and you're concerned about cellulitis, you're going to look and you're going to see, do they have erythema? So is it red? Is it warm? So if you put on a glove and you, and you feel the area, is it warm? Is it tender to light touch? So I'll, I'll just touch the area and, and see if it's if it's painful. Uh, and, and is there swelling? So sometimes swelling can be very apparent, but if they have swelling, it doesn't always mean that it's, it's uh, you know, from a non-infectious cause. If they have an infection, I would expect some swelling there. And, and so, you know, when you look at it, do they have an infection or not an infection? And sometimes it's, it can be quite hard to tell. And the labs can be uh, sometimes unhelpful. So if you get labs, sometimes we'll get questions and they'll say, I think it's a cellulitis, but they're, they're, they don't have a leukocytosis. They don't have an elevated ESR CRP. And I would tell them, if you feel like it's a cellulitis, go with your clinical uh, clinical feeling. So trust your, your clinical intuition and, and treat it for cellulitis if that's what you think it is. And uh, important to know that most cellulitis are caused by beta hel hemolytic streptococci. And um, despite knowing this, many times patients are getting treated for MRSA coverage. And MRSA is um, predominant in the community, but for cellulitis, it's important to know if you have purulence pus with cellulitis, then MRSA or MSSA play a part. But if you do not have pus or purulence, it's very low likelihood that MRSA is playing a part. So adding MRSA coverage in those circumstances is not beneficial. And so we mentioned <laughs> beta hemolytic strep. And so this uh, is what we're talking about when we say beta hemolytic strep. So we're talking about pyogenes or agalactiae. You know, this is what you want to be thinking when they have a, a cellulitis without pus, without abscesses. The most likely thing is going to be strep. And we usually uh, obtain all of our data from IDSA guidelines. So we will be discussing now 2014 updated um, skin and soft tissue guidelines um, by IDSA. And the most helpful thing in those guidelines is going to be this, this algorithm. And this algorithm gives a good foundation to how to think of cellulitis. So when you're thinking about it, when you're kind of organizing, what should I uh, give? What antibiotics should I give for what type of uh, infection that you're seeing? The first division here for the management of skin and soft tissue infections is gonna be pus or no pus. So on the right here, they have pus. So it has furuncle, carbuncle, abscesses. And if you're seeing pus or abscesses, if it's mild, so if it's if it's a small abscess, you think inf uh, incision and drainage. And here it says incision and drainage and no antibiotics. The most recent information actually says if you give antibiotics a short course, like five days, it'll lower the likelihood of having reoccurrence and actually lower the likelihood of them needing to, to come back in for, uh, for antibiotics. So mild is incision and drainage, moderate incision and drainage and culture and susceptibility. And empiric treatment is gonna be trimethoprim sulfa or doxycycline uh, and defined treatment. So once you have a susceptibility report, MRSA, it says trimethoprim sulfa or MSSA, dicloxacillin or cephalexin. And then for severe infections with, with pus and abscesses, Empiric treatment is going to be uh, IV antibiotics with vancomycin, daptomycin, linazolid, telavancin, ceftaroline. Uh, and defined is going to be MRSA. You, you can use the same as empiric. And MSSA, you're thinking nafcillin, cefazolin would be ideal. Here it also has clindamycin. And it only has clindamycin where you have a, a susceptibility report showing that it's, it's susceptible to clindamycin. But really, if you can give a beta-lactam, that would be the best choice for MSSA and really only giving clindamycin if you don't have other options or they have a, an allergy uh, to, to uh, you know, one of the beta-lactams. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Um, 
like you said, this um, diagram is fantastic because it really breaks down uh, purulence versus non-purulence cellulitis very nicely. So for non-purulence, for mild uh, cellulitis, um, oral antimicrobials, um, preferably a beta-lactam like penicillin BK, cephalosporins, dicloxacillin, all clindamycin if needed is appropriate. But when you have moderate cellulitis, um, so, you know, redness, warmth, but no purulence at all, uh, it, at this time, you'll probably need to admit the patient or give IV antimicrobial therapy. So here's when you're again targeting strep species with penicillin, ceftriaxone, cephalosporin, or clindamycin. And then in the non-purulent cellulitis, you have the severe category. And this is where you're worried about ruling out necrotizing fasciitis. Um, patient is septic, not doing well, hypotensive, really bad infection. Um, in this case, you need to do broad spectrum antimicrobials. So vancomycin plus peptazotazobactam, perpacillin tazobactam. And culture is important. Uh, surgery is important. Um, plus, it's important to add clindamycin, as you see below, um, because clindamycin, if it's a streptococcal infection, binds to the toxin that is released by the streptococcus. And we'll talk about it a little bit further down the slides. Thank you. So here are some examples of, this is cellulitis with abscess. So when we had that division of pus or no pus, so here, these, these are all pus and you see this is an abscess and it doesn't really have a surrounding cellulitis. This needs an incision and drainage and uh, probably a, a few days of uh, antibiotics and you know culture and susceptibility uh, to make sure that you're covering the right thing and you know covering MRSA if needed, uh, which would be the most likely thing in in uh, in these community community acquired abscesses, community acquired uh, cellulitis with abscess and pus, and so all of these will need incision and drainage. That would be really the most important thing here. If there's a, a large amount of surrounding cellulitis. Um, then again, you'd give um, a, a course, usually five to seven days of, of antibiotics um, to make sure that that cellulitis, you know, doesn't continue to spread and everything. So here's question one, this will be cut out. And then do you want to talk about the next slide, the clindamycin? Yeah. Again, um, as Dr. Horn just described, when you see abscess, you're thinking about MRSA, and a good coverage for that uh, would be trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, uh, doxycycline, or if needed, linazolid. Um, clindamycin, there's over 50% resistant to MRSA. It's not very reliable, so be very careful when using clindamycin for MRSA coverage. But the three other options here listed are very good. And then this will be cut out. Uh, and then the next one's gonna be cellulitis images. Um, do you wanna talk about that or should I talk about it? Yeah. I could start with the first one and you could dump to the streaking. Okay, oh yeah, that's right, okay. And, and here are some pictures of um, streptococcal cellulitis. As you could see, redness, it appears swollen. Um, and it appears the redness is spreading further up. So this is classic strep cellulitis picture. And then here's a, an infection showing streaking up the arm. So you can have this, you know, either streaking up the arm like this or streaking up the leg. If, it, if it's streaking, you know, I uh, would consider it severe because it's, it's, you know, it can be rapidly spreading and needs to be uh, under control very quickly. So yeah, I, I would cover this uh, very aggressively. Um, and if there's something to culture, so if there's pus here, it'd be important to get a culture, but I would be very aggressive if you see uh, this type of streaking up the leg or streaking up the arm. So when you start treatment, typically um, the redness takes a while to um, resolve. So cellulitis may appear worse within the first 24 to 48 hours, despite antibiotic therapy. And this may be due to toxins and bacterial lysis that drives inflammation, even though the antibiotics is working. So sometimes it's really important to reassure your patient 
they're clinically doing okay, that it's okay to have redness as they're clinically getting better and if the warmthness is getting better. So next slide, Dr. Hornet will explain why that is. And so you can see here, these, this is the uh, bacterial cell. And here you have some exotoxins in, inside. And here you have the endotoxins, part of the cell wall. And you know when there's lysis, when you're on the appropriate antibiotics, the cell will, the cell will break apart. And it, all of these uh, endotoxins or exotoxins will kind of spread out and, and cause more inflammation sometimes. And so sometimes we'll have either a darker red or, or more erythema, and then it can be spreading outside the lines. And when it spreads outside the lines, people uh, oftentimes get very worried and want to escalate antibiotics. But really, if they're feeling better, if the pain is decreasing, if they feel like they're improving or they're, um, you know, if, if their labs or their vitals are improving, you know, you may be on the right antibiotics. It may just need more time. But this is a good example of, you know, uh, when people ask, why would it be getting more red? Why is there more inflammation if they're on the right antibiotics? Um, and, and so this is a, a good picture that kind of shows that. So as you see here, we have a patient who has cellulitis and it's nicely demarcated with the redness around that area. This is day one and he's getting appropriate antimicrobial therapy. On day two, the redness is spreading outside the area that is marked. So it looks appears the redness is getting worse, but patient is clinically doing well and stable. And on day three, as you see, the redness is resolving and it's uh, disappearing. So sometimes the redness takes a while to disappear, even though they're in the right therapy and they're clinically improving. And then question three, this will be cut out as well. And then do you want to talk about necrotizing fasciitis or we can both talk about it? Uh, you, you could do that one. You could. Yeah. <clears throat> and here we have some pictures of necrotizing fasciitis and you can see how severe this is. So that you can see that, uh, you know, this uh, sometimes necrotizing fasciitis uh, isn't as apparent at first. You know, generally what we think of it as pain out of proportion. So if the patient has pain out of proportion, like here, if, if this patient first presented uh, and they didn't have much in the way of findings of the leg, they may be pointing to their thighs saying, you know, they have 10 out of 10 pain in their leg. And sometimes with, when necrotizing fasciitis starts early, there isn't very much in the way of physical findings or uh, imaging findings. So it's important to have a high degree of suspicion you know, high degree of clinical suspicion for could this be necrotizing fasciitis with all of this pain? And so it can start off and not be very apparent. Um, and imaging is really a late uh, finding. So if you get imaging, if there's air within the tissues, as this is showing, like this is a CT scan of the leg showing air in the tissues, then uh, that, that would really show you what it is. Um, so it's important to get a surgery consult you know, if, if I am concerned about it, I'll uh, call surgery and then get a CT scan while I'm waiting for them to come and see the patient. Um, but really here you see this uh, kind of uh, dead tissue duskiness around it. Um, so I'd be starting vancomycin, piperacillin, tazobactam, and clindamycin while I'm waiting. But really the treatment here is going to be a, a, a surgical debridement. And then we have question four, and then the next one is bites. Uh, do you want to talk about bites? Yeah, sure. And, and bites. Um, so we get a lot of questions on um, different types of bites. So if you have a cat bite, it caused by pastorella. Um, if you have a dog bite, it caused by capnocytophaga. If you have a human bite, it caused by echinella. So what are the appropriate treatment for it? different types of bite, the best uh, treatment is uh, um, amoxicillin clavulanate, uh, oral antimicrobials. If for some reason a patient cannot take amoxicillin clavulanate, then you can do, especially if they're penicillin allergy, doxycycline or bactrim or levofloxacin plus metronidazole or clindamycin. It's a combination treatment. 
it's important when you have different types of bites to treat appropriately so that um, infection is um, improving. And this will be cut out. And then this one will be cut out. And this, um, the end slide, we could say thank you for joining us. And we could we could have them put that right next to the other one and then have the yeah. questions after that and then they're done or we could do it either way. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, okay, do you wanna just say thank you for joining us? Yeah, and sure. Okay. Thank you so much for, for joining our educational webinar on diagnosis and treatment of cellulitis and looking forward to the, um, seeing you all on the next webinar. Thank you.